So I think we could be resuming our lecture. So in the first session, then we, uh, of course, talked about the first period and second period. And I really, really enjoyed your questions and comments. So let us just keep on this good momentum for the third period as well as the fourth period as well. So the third period that is from 1980 to 1997, what were the challenges at the time? Well, in fact, you could say success was the challenge at the time because Korean economy developed and I keep on telling you about the meaning of 1986 and then by 1986, then large number of countries around the world, they were looking at Korea and then, and then said, well, Korea, you are no longer a small boy. You must understand you're a big boy and you must behave like a big boy. And then it was back in 1984, it was the first year that United States, in fact, it imposed something called anti-dumping measure against a Korean product. Can you guess what was the first ever Korean product which was subject to anti-dumping measure by the United States? Can you guess? Please. Washing machine? Well, <laughs> good guess, but at the same time, it was last year. But at the same time, the first Korean product which met with anti-dumping measure by the United States, there was color television being manufactured by Samsung. So Samsung color television, it in fact ended up with the owner of being the first Korean product that was subject to uh, anti-dumping measure by the United States. But at the same time, it was just beginning. Then there were other measures that in fact were imposed on Korea. One of them was something called Section 301 measure. These days, we hear a lot about Section 301 measure. The United States, in fact, it is, well, in fact, imposing this Section 301 measure in a big way against which country? Can you guess? These days, the United States is imposing a huge Section 301 measure against which country? China, of course, right? But back in the 1980s, then United States was imposing Section 301 measure against Korean products, right? In various different areas, insurance, uh, well, and IPR, tobacco, etc., etc. So there was one pressure coming from outside world, right? Back in the 1980s. That, in fact, is the reason why I said it was a challenge arising from economic success, right? But at the same time, there was another challenge, which, in fact, came from within our own economy, which is, as Korean economy began to grow, then the issue arose about how to further promote productivity. Because the size was growing larger, but at the same time, productivity, it was lagging. So how to promote productivity of the Korean economy? It was a, our own internal challenge. So we had to meet those challenges. That was the challenge of the time. Challenge arising from economic success, from the outside world in the form of anti-dumping measure, in the form of Section 301 measure, but at the same time from our own internal well, source, which was how to promote Korea's productivity, Korean economy's productivity. So that was the challenge of the time. And then how did we meet those challenges? We tried to meet those challenges through something called quote-unquote liberalization. We tried to meet those challenges through further liberalizing Korean economy. So the first thing I should be telling you about is five-year tariff reduction plan well, in the second period, we discussed about Korea's five-year economic development plan, which started in 1962. Twenty years later, we were having another five-year plan. This time, it was a five-year plan to reduce Korean tariffs, which started in 1983. So when we started that autonomous, voluntary, purely voluntary tariff reduction plan, Korea's average tariff rate, it was 23, uh, more than 
23%. After 10 years, when we were done with this voluntary autonomous tariff reduction plan, it came down to 7.9%. But at the same time, there were other measures we introduced, we kept on introducing for further liberalization of the Korean economy. And then, of course, there was Uruguay round negotiations, which I already told you about. And then in Uruguay round, then, of course, there were new areas of liberalization which were introduced into the GET system, which is now WT system. And they were, of course, trading services was introduced into the GET system. IPR was introduced into the, into the WT system. DSU, that is to say dispute settlement understanding, was introduced into the WTO system. But at the same time, along with services, along with intellectual property, along with dispute settlement system, then again, tariff reduction for industrial products was a very important issue. And at the time, we didn't have this expression, which is NAMA. NAMA is for, well, manufactured products, reduction of tariffs for manufactured products. When it comes to tariff reduction, Korea, in fact, among all the GET members uh, at the time, Korea, in fact, was the second best performing uh, negotiating country in terms of the, 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 the size or significance of tariff reduction. So that was another major effort Korea made in, in the area of uh, uh, liberalization. And Korea, in fact, introduced our own system of ODA quite early. That, that, that in fact, was introduced back in 19, uh, 1987. And then in 1988, we accepted Article 8 obligation of IMF agreement. What we mean by Article 8 obligation is this, which is that, well, so far, I talked about liberalization, and then all those measures I told you about Korea's liberalization, that was in the area of trade in goods, right? These liberalization I told you about, they were in the area of trade in goods. But, well, in order, tr in order to trade, then, of course, you need money, right? And then this is something I told you in the first period, I told you in the second period. Korea was always short of money, especially foreign exchange. And then because of it, Korea, in fact, was imposing various different kinds of restrictions on the movement of capital, on the movement of money, right? In 1988, what we did was, we, of course, Korea was, by the time, Korea was, of course, a member of IMF, but Korea was taking an exception from application of Article 8 of uh, uh, well, IMF agreement. What it meant was, in current account, current account means, well, the, uh, the, the, the capital movement related with trading goods and trading services. So when you trade in goods or when you trade in services, then of course there is movement of capital. And movement of capital related with trading goods and trading services, we call it current account. And Article 8 of uh, IMF agreement, it allowed certain members who in fact were having difficulty in their management of foreign exchange to take an exception from complying with Article 8 of the uh, IMF agreement. What Korea did at the time was, well, we will graduate from this exception. We, in fact, will liberalize our current account movement. That happened in 1988. 1989, what did Korea do? Well, earlier in the second, uh, in the second period, then one of uh, your colleagues, she raised a question about Korea's developing country status in GATT. And one of the things Korea was benefiting from Korea's developing country status as a member of GATT was something called Article 18B exception. And Article 18B of GATT agreement at the time, it in fact allowed GATT members to take exceptional trade restrictive measures when they have difficulty in something called BOP. That's balance of payment. So that, in fact, was another special and differential treatment being allowed to developing countries of GATT. 
which was called Article 18B. And then up until that time, when I say that time, that was 1989, then Korea continued to benefit from that BOP exception on the Article 18B of GATT agreement. 1989, we said we will graduate. So we no longer took exception under the cover of Article 18B of GATT. Article uh, 1989, the same year, then we became a founding member of APEC. 1996, as I already told you, another major, major progress in Korea's uh, progress towards liberalization that was Korean accession to the OECD, which happened in 19, 1996. I remember the OECD Council meeting, meeting on October 23rd, and it was at that OECD Council meeting, which in fact decided to welcome Korea as a member of OECD. That happened on October 23rd, 1986. How do I remember the date, October 23rd? Because that is the birthday of my son. <laughs> so that happened on October 23rd. And what was, what was the meaning of Korea's accession to the OECD? I told you about all those liberalization measures we, take, we took in the area of trading goods, and I told you all those uh, liberalization measures we took in terms of current account movement, but at the same time, they were in those specific sectors, but we thought, well, OECD membership, it in fact will provide us with an opportunity to look at various laws and regulations and the systems we have in our government and then review them so that it will serve us as one huge opportunity to be, in fact, taking ne necessary measures in order to further liberalize our economic system. So across the board measures, rather than uh, sector-specific measures. That, in fact, was Korea's motivation to join the OECD. And as I already told you, then in order to become the OECD member, we had to well, go through examination in 11 different committees. And I was, I was there as a, as a, as a uh, member of uh, Korea now. Well, at the time, we didn't have delegation to the OECD. We had uh, a kind of uh, preparatory mission to negotiate Korean accession to the OECD. So I was already there uh, as a member of that preparatory delegation. And I, in fact, participated in large number of examinations, but my responsibility was the trade committee. So I was participating in trade committee examination, but at the same time, there were two other very important committees we had to go through. One of them was CMS Summit, that is about movement of capital, and another was ELSA committee, it was about Korea's labor conditions. So they were the three important committees that we had to go through. And uh, well, one of the questions which arose in the whole process was Korea's developing country status. And uh, one of, one of your, your colleagues raised that question already in the second, second uh, period. So we can just skip it. 1998, then uh, what, what happened in 1998 was, well, 1997, when I say 1997, what comes up in your mind? 1997, we had something called Asian financial crisis. Asian financial crisis. And we had to go through it. How did we go through that Asian financial crisis? Through further liberalization of Korean economic system. We didn't raise up our protectionist war. We went just the other way around. We tried to meet the challenge through further liberalization. And one of the measures we took, I already told you about liberalization measures in trade and goods. I told you about liberalization measures we took in our current account movement. But another very important liberalization we took was, I already told you about OECD membership, Korea's accession to the OECD and CMS Summit. CMS Summit, CMS Summit membership meant well, in a sense, large measure of liberalization measures we had to take in the movement of capital, capital account. So Article 8 of IMF, it was about current account restrictions, but through Korea's accession, 
to the uh, OECD, especially Korean uh, the, the Committee of CMS Summit. Then we took large measures of liberalization measures for the capital account as well. What in fact remained as an important restrictive measure for Korea's external economic relations was exchange rate system for Korea. Because up until that time, up until 1998, up until the Asian financial crisis of 1997, then in fact there were large, say, series of measures Korea took in order to further liber liberalize Korea's foreign exchange system. The free floating of Korean currency, it happened as a measure, series of measures Korea took in order to respond to the uh, Asian financial crisis of 1997. So as I look back, I just think 1970s, from 1980 up until 1997, I think that period was the golden age of liberalization of Korean economy, but at the same time, it was not just the Korean economy. During that period of time, that is to say 1980 up until 1997, other Asian economies also took a large measure of liberalization. So I just look upon that period as golden age of liberalization. And then obviously, of course, diplomacy, Korean diplomacy and Korean diplomats had to play a very important role during that period of uh, liberal, liberalization period. So that, I think, is for the third period. And your turn. Questions and comments. So something that the United States has dealt with, um, where I'm from, um, is a growing uh, wealth divide, uh, which is sort of accompanied with the uh, liberalization of uh, our economy. So I'm curious if Korea has ever had, had to deal with uh, a wealth divide or something of that matter. Well, could you repeat your question? Yeah, so has there, is Korea dealing with, or ever dealt with, especially during this time, a uh, problem with like a, a wealth divide between the middle class and the lower class? Um, has that ever been an issue that had to uh, be dealt with during this time? Is the question about polarization of the economy? That question reminds me about one conversation I had with my Mexican colleague back in 1997. And as I already told you, Korea joined the OECD in 1996, which happened in December. The decision at the council was made in October, but Korea's actual accession was done in December 1996. Just one year later, in 1997, then we met with Asian financial crisis. And then because of it, well, back in Seoul, people were saying, well, one of the reasons why we are meeting with IMF crisis, it is because our accession to the, uh, to the uh, OECD was premature. That, in fact, was the complaint I often heard back in 1997. And then uh, how do you think I would have felt by the complaint? Because as I already told you, I was part of the team, member of the team, negotiating Korea's accession to the OECD. And people back home, they were saying, well, one of the reasons why we're having this crisis, it is because of premature accession to the OECD. I didn't like it. But at the same time, uh, well, of course, I had to work. And I remember one conversation I had with my Mexican colleague at the time. He came to talk to me, and then he said, well, many years back, Mexico joined the OECD. One year after that uh, accession, then we had Mexican financial crisis. And then we had exactly the same, say, uh, complaint back in Mexico City, that Mexico joined OECD maybe too prematurely, and then that is the reason why we're having that, uh, that uh, financial crisis. But, I don't believe in that. I mean, that's what that Mexican colleague told me. And of course, I agreed with him. I, I, did, I did not think that Korea's accession to the OECD had anything to do with uh, the, the financial crisis of 1997. One of the reasons why I thought it was not the case was because uh, 
Korea was not the only country having that uh, financial crisis in Asia. Where I, as I already told you, there was Indonesia, there was Malaysia, there were the Philippines, there was Thailand. And then all of those countries, of course, they didn't have anything to do with the OECD, but they were having the crisis all at the same time. So definitely it was not the reason. But what that Mexican colleague told me was, was this, which is, I know Korea, and then I know that you will be able to meet with this financial crisis soon enough. But there is one thing you have to remember, which is, somehow this is something we experienced in Mexico, which is where there was a crisis and we met with those, those, those challenges. And one consequence of the challenge was, I mean, outcome of that crisis was, financial crisis was, somehow there was sharp rise in polarization, economic polarization in the, in the Mexican, Mexican economy. That may be something you will have to watch out and that may be something you should be careful about. That in fact was something I heard from him and kept in my mind. Fortunately, that didn't happen in a conspicuous manner with the Korean economy. But it was after 2008 financial crisis and then, and then 10 years later, we had, uh, well, another financial crisis in 2008. Then, of course, we are already going into the fourth period. But anyhow, we could overcome or go through the financial crisis of 2008 without too much difficulty, right? But somehow, it was in the aftermath of 2008 that there were increasing signs in the Korean economy that, in fact, there is growing gap of income between the very rich and then the very poor. In other words, well, in a sense, sharp increase in polarization, economic polarization in the Korean economy. So that, in fact, to sum up what I just shared with you, was not much of an issue back in 1997 or 1998, which became a far bigger issue after the financial crisis of 2008. And I just wonder what could be the economic explanation for the growing economic polarization could crisis have something to do with it? Maybe, but at the same time, I think there would be more important reason, which is fundamental and structural change in the economy. Fundamental and structural change in the economy, which is, well, these days what we are saying is this, which is that back in 1960s and 70s, economic growth, it translated itself into job growth and growth in income. That was 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So economic growth, it was always accompanied with growth in job and growth in income, which is not happening today. So maybe it has something to do with technology. Maybe it has something more to do with the structural change of the economy. So what crisis, financial crisis, well, could be partly explaining in the sense that, well, well one thing which happens, which, which always happens, when you try to go through the uh, financial crisis if, is, of course, the collapse of the mi middle, mi middle, middle, middle income families, middle income households. That's what we always happens during the time of financial crisis. So that, in fact, would be a part of the explanation. But telling from Korea's own national experiences of late 1970s and then, and then after the financial crisis, global financial crisis of 2008, Maybe there is uh, certain other forces which are working for this growing economic polarization. So that's an issue in the United States. That's an issue in Korea. That's an issue in, uh, in, 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 in Western Europe. So where, as a, as a government official, I've been working on those issues, but now it is your turn. You should be coming up with more innovative ways of how to deal with these growing signs of economic polarization. Thank you. And then any other question? Um, so is there economic polarization between the younger generation and the older generation? So does the younger generation benefit more greatly from the economic development? And also, what does the welfare system in Korea do to bridge that gap between a, young, a richer younger generation and a poor old generation? So what you are thinking is that there is general issue for this 
for this growing income gap. And then it is your view that younger generation is benefiting more from all these changes taking place in the, in the economy. And then maybe this polarization could be happening because of older generation failing to adapt themselves to these uh, changes in the economy. Is, is it your view? Not failing, but being left out of it. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, could be. But at the same time, well, this is something I already told you, which is that well, Korea's economic development, that in fact uh, happened, most of it happened in 1970s and 80s and 90s. And at the time, I in fact was an uh, undergraduate student uh, from between 1975 and 1978. And at the time, we didn't care too much about if we will end up with a good job after graduation. We thought, well, there are so many jobs. Whatever you do in college, whether you study hard or whether you just wine and dine when you graduate, then you will end up with a good job. That's what we thought back in 1970s. And then it was not, well, the environment which in fact was encouraging you to, to, to study too hard. So that in fact was the situation at that time. So in other words, back in those days, 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, then people benefited hugely from this ship floating up with the ebb, with the ebb of water coming in. So everybody was just float, floating up. So job was not an issue, income was not an issue, economy was growing, everybody was benefiting from it. But at the same time, these days, it is not happening in Korea. It is not happening in Western Europe. It is not happening in the United States. That is to say, again, employment rate or unemployment rate is dropping down to historical levels in the United States, right? But somehow, income is not keeping up, right? The wage is not keeping up. So, well, in a sense, it is not necessarily generational gap, but, but I think it is, uh, it, it, is, it is more, say, the technology changing, and then it is not just generational question. I think it is younger generation as well, who in fact will have to keep up with those changes taking place in the technology, taking place in, in, the, in the economy. Well, I think there is an Israeli, philosopher by the name of Harari. Have you heard about something called Homo Deus? Homo Deus? Have you, have you, have you heard, about, heard about that book, Homo Deus, written by Harari? And then there is Harari's, Harari's view in the sense that, well, because of all these uh, techno, te technolo technological changes, if you can keep up and adapt yourself to these te technological changes, then you, in fact, would be elevating yourself from homo sapiens, that's 20th century human being, to homo deus of the 21st century. But if you fail to adapt yourself to the change, then you will end up with homo hopeless. Homo hopeless. So if in the homo, homo sapiens in the, in the 20th century, then there was more level playing field for all well, citizens. That was during the period of Homo sapiens. Well, in the 21st century, then this gap between Homo Deus, I mean human beings, equipped with that, all that knowledge and training and understanding of all those technological changes, who in fact would have significantly enhanced their capabilities and would be in a far more enhanced position than Homo sapiens of 20th century, so they would be Homo Deus. But if you fail to do that, then you will end up as Homo hopeless. So there will be a huge gap between Homo Deus and then Homo hopeless. That was Harari's view. We don't have to necessarily subscribe to his view. But at the same time, I think the gist of your question was, well, this economic gap, is there any generational, generational say, factor involved in that uh, economic gap? Maybe you could say, well, younger generation, they would be in a, in a better position to adapt themselves. Older generation, less adept to be 
adapting this uh, uh, themselves. So that could be an explanation. But at the same time, I think more imp important factor would be how capable you would be in adapting yourself to those changes, technological changes, and the structural changes taking place in the economy. So um, one thing that's really unique about Korea's um, like economic situation is the Chebol system that it has implemented. And um, I took a class last semester and we learned that it really did help with uh, Korea's econom um, economic situation and it helped with its development. But a lot of critics are saying that it's time to move away from the system. Like it did in fact help, but now there's this like polarization kind of um, just to go off of her question, there's like this sort of polarization of wealth within these uh, um, huge companies. So I was just wondering if, what, what your opinion was on the whole Chebo system and if you think that Korea should keep it, you know, as it is now or if we should sort of break up the system and move away towards something less intense, like intensified. Well, thank you for the question. Well, as a matter of fact, so far, we have talked about, on the one hand, Korea's economic development. On the other hand, there was a question about Korean political system. I mean, how authoritarian, authoritarian system impacted, impacted Korea's economic growth. And then just a minute ago, then we were discussing about this income gap and then how that income gap, in fact, uh, is in fact being, being in a sense, uh, were created and aggravated because of all those changes taking place in the technology ch ch taking place in the structure of the economy. But at the same time, I, I think our friend is raising another very important factor, which is, what about Chebol system? Isn't Chebol system, which is uniquely Korean, isn't Chebol system responsible for this growing income gap in the Korean society? So that, in fact, is a third factor that we should be seriously thinking about income gap in the Korean society. And then, uh, where, as I already told you about authoritarian rule, then somehow we could take necessary measures to move away from authoritarian system back in 1987. And then that adjustment that we have achieved as a society to the political system, at the end of the day, left a very positive impact upon Korea's development economically, politically, and then socially otherwise. So that's what I already told you in response to the question coming from one of your friends. And then I have to say the same thing about Chebol system. Why did Chebol grow, grow the way it grew in the Korean economy? Well, when I was talking about the first period, then I told you about input substitution industry. And we should be very thankful for those. Uh, well, at the time, they were often of course, one of Chebols. They were small business houses. We, I, I personally, as well as I think Korea is a so society, we should be feeling thankful to them in the sense that at the very least, they in fact started a very basis for Korea's industrial development, right? With very low level of technology, very low level of capital, very low, low level of institutionalization, but somehow they, they succeeded in doing it and in the second period, this is something I already told you, in the second period, then Korea was busy to develop its economy. And Korea wanted to do it in a private sector driven way. And then that, I think, was a, was a wise decision. Korea wanted to do it in a private sector driven way. We didn't let public and ent state enterprises to be playing an important role for Korea's economic development. We, in fact, were at the time, we didn't have this concept of PPP, public-private partnership. But I think even if we didn't have that expression, we thought it should be the private sector which should be uh, playing the leading role. So that, I think, is the reason why in 1960s and 70s, when, it, when government was trying to come up with fast export-driven industrialization, then they had to work with somebody and then th when they had to work with somebody, then, then of course there was LG, there was Samsung, there was Hyundai. They were, always, they were already there, in a sense, participating in input substitution industries. And they had, in fact, the basic elements to go even further. 
in terms of capital, in terms of capital, uh, technology, in terms of institutionalization. So in a sense, it was natural and logical choice for the government to work with them, right? And then as Korean economy grew and all those business house, houses grew as well, to in fact grew into chevers. So initially, when I say initially back in 70s and back in 90, 80s and 90s, they in fact had far more positive contribution to make for Korea's national economic development. But at the same time, as everything in life, if it is too good, maybe it is too good, right? And then they, that in fact, that heavy dependence upon, upon Chebol, that in fact had many negative aspects as well. So that is the reason why in Korea we have FTC, Fair Trade Commission, and then that is the reason why I already told you about Korea being the 12th largest economy in the whole world. But when it comes to the, the influence of FTC as an institution, of course they have an FTC in the United States, and then they have uh, equivalent institutions in Europe, etc., etc. And then if you compare those FTCs, somehow Korean FTC is a far more influential institution, far more say, important role being played than 12th economy in the whole world. I mean, there are a large number of countries with larger economy than us, but at the same time, they are, well, well, in a sense, equivalent institutions of FTC. They are not as strong as, uh, as Korean FTC. Korean FTC is a very strong institution, and I think we need a strong FTC. Why? Because of very peculiar way through which Korean economy grew, and then as I, as I already told you, those chebers made a huge contribution for the development of the Korean economy. But at the same time, there were certain negative aspects of uh, chebor system. And then FTC was, in a sense, empowered to deal with those negative aspects of the Korean economy. And then as we moved away from authoritarian government system, then I think we should be moving away from to heavy dependence upon chebors and that, that in fact is a homework we've been dealing with so far you know, in a successful manner. Well, I think we are done with the questions and then we can move to the fourth period. Okay, um, I thank you for the answer. <laughs> um, I have one last question. Um, during the lecture, you talked about the multi-fiber arrangement um, in the 1970s and um, I have a class in international trade policy here at uh, KU University and we talked about it and um, during the uh, lecture we actually learned that the multi-fiber agreement arrangement was um, to um, protect the, especially the European textile industry from um, Asian imports mm -hmm. and so how did South Korea handled this um, this arrangement because it, it was more supposed to oppress uh, suppress the, um, the the Korean industry than support it. So how how did Korea handle that? You're absolutely right in the sense that the whole idea of MFA it was to protect uh, textile workers and textile industry in Western Europe as well as in no North America. So that in fact was one of the motivation. But at the same time, I think what is important is to, to understand that, in fact, there was a fine balance between protecting uh, textile workers and industry in, in Western Europe and North America, but at the same time, in a sense, provide certain, uh, say, uh, say uh, optimum level of market for exporters of textile from all the developing countries. So, as I told you during the, during the lecture, then, uh, at that time, one of the main areas where much quote-unquote trade negotiation was taking place was to negotiate the quota, the size of the quota for each of the exporters and each of the importers. So that in fact was a very important negotiation taking place uh, at that time for trade in textile and clothing. And I think all in all, it was well in a sense, uh, well trying to good, maintain a good balance between the inter interests of exporters and importers. All of it, in fact, were reflected in the Uruguay round negotiation. And in the Uruguay round negotiation, which lasted the, uh, from 1985 
to up until 1994, where how to, in fact, graduate from multi-fiber agreement, that, in fact, was one of the important goals for the whole Uruguay round negotiation as well. And then what they agreed upon was to graduate from multi-fiber agreement with the inauguration of WTO. And then that, in fact, is something which happened at the time of inauguration of uh, WTO. So instead of MFA, they came up with a new agreement for the WTO, which was called ATC. ATC stood for Agreement on Textile and Clothing. And then what it aimed to do was, well, in a sense, put a total end to the multi-fiber uh, multi agreement system. When, when we say total end, it means a, a multi-fiber agreement. It, in fact, stood on the basis of collection of all different quota arrangements, and quota system as such was to be, in a sense, abolished with coming into force of WTO and coming into force of ATC, Agreement on Textile and Clothing. And in order to oversee the whole process of implementing ATC, they came up with something called Textile Monitoring Board, TMB. So Textile Monitoring Board was a new institution which in fact was inaugurated with the inauguration of WTO back in 1995. And TMB was a very unique institution in the sense that, well, if you go to WTO, then you participate as a representative of your country. For example, I used to work for the WTO, and at the time, I used to work as a representative of Republic of Korea. But I also used to work as a member of uh, TMB. And then at TMB, you are not there as a representative of a state. You are there on your personal status, pers per, uh, in your personal capacity. And then there were five members from textile exporting countries and five members from textile importing countries. And then at the time, when I used to be the member of TMB, I used to be representing textile exporting countries, but in my personal capacity, not as a representative of the uh, Republic of Korea. So that, in fact, used to be a very unique institution. And then somehow, that institution was there for 10 years. And then within, within those 10 years, then we could ensure that the uh, ATC, Agreement on Textile and Clothing, would, in fact, be effectively implemented. And uh, well, that, in fact, is how the whole world graduated from multi-fiber um, arrangement. Uh, okay, so I would like to ask you a question you asked about the third period uh -huh. that you were speaking about during the lecture. Right. Um, and hearing you, you explaining the, the fast-paced change of the liberalization uh, process that you had uh -huh. uh, makes me think about, you know, the way that South Korea proceeded through your, your plans and the way other countries have been doing it. Because you went through... Um, a process of liberalization that other countries might have done in 200 years within just 50 years. <laughs> right. So, uh, my question is, what would you say has been seen as a side effect of this? Because in my perspective, there, there must be side effects when fast, such, such fast changes is taking place. So, what would you say are the main side effects of this fast change? Well, or has been? Right, right. Well, I, I think I should be making several points. One, why it was the case that Korea was introducing all those quote-unquote liberalization measures at such fast-paced, uh, in a sense, pace. What was the motivation for Korea? I think it was the combination of two factors. One, external pressure. Whether we liked it or not, then there was very heavy pressure coming from abroad for example, coming from the United States. And then this is, this is something I shared with you. Mm. I mean, anti-dumping measures. The, the first time we were exposed to anti-dumping, that was back in 1984. And to, to be frank with you, we didn't understand too much about what anti-dumping measure was. Mm. And then, uh, well, uh, th this is a very technical detail, but the way United States conducts anti-dumping investigation, there are two institutions involved. Well, when it comes to Injury, I mean, there will be no anti-dumping measure unless there is injury. Injury determination is made by an institution called ITC, International Trade Commission. 
but at the same time, you cannot impose anti-dumping measure unless there is dumping margin. Calculation of dumping margin, that is done by the Department of Commerce. So there are two U.S. federal agencies involved. On the one hand, ITC for injury determination. On the other hand, Department of Commerce for dumping margin calculation. I know it now. We didn't know it back in 1984. So there were a lot of pressure uh, being, in a sense, imposed upon Korea. And then, and then, of course, it was followed by a large number of special Section 301 as well as special, special 301 measures. So whether we liked it or not, then we had to liberalize. There was an external pressure. But at the same time, the reason why we could so, well, in a sense, effectively in our, in our well, efforts for uh, liberalization, if it had been just external pressure, then I think internally there could have been resistance yeah. to, the, to, the, to, the, to the pressure. And resistance, and then it could ha have ended up by saying, Korea taking half-hearted measures in the direction of liberalization. And then if that had been the case, then liberalization would not have ended up with all those positive impact upon the Korean economy. But the thing is, during the time when there was external pressure from abroad, even internally, we in fact were thinking that we need further liberalization. Why? Because well, there was uh, an American economist by the name of Paul Krugman, and then he wrote a very interesting article back in 1993. And then uh, that article was, uh, well, in, in fact titled as Myth of Asian Miracle. Myth of Asian Miracle. And that article was written by somebody called Paul Krugman. And then what he tried to write in that article was, well, Asian economies on the surface they were doing very well. How did they develop the economy? I mean, Asian economies, how did they develop? They, in fact, developed the economies through, well, ampli amplification of production factors, by which he meant they added labor, they added capital, and then it is, sh it is purely on the size of labor, it is purely on the size of capital that Asian economies could develop the economy. But at the same time, there is another very in, uh, important aspect to economic growth, which is growth in productivity. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, is qualitative growth versus quantitative growth. Mm -hmm. But if we analyze the contents of Asian economic development, it was mostly quantitative development. There was no qualitative development. That's what he wrote in 1993, Myth of Asian Miracle. And then he said, well, Development of Asian economy, that's a myth. Why? Because there was no qualitative development. There was no develop, uh, growth in productivity. So that's what he said in 1993, but we, in fact, were experiencing it and then thinking about it. I mean, how to improve our productivity. That, in fact, was something we were already thinking about in Korea back in late 1980s. So even if uh, we did it partly because of the pressure coming from abroad, but in a sense, we felt we were feeling the need to go in the direction of further liberalization. Mm -hmm. So it was the happy, say, in fact, meeting of pressure coming from abroad and then, and then the need we felt from home. So that is the reason why, as I already told you, had it been the case that it was simply the outside pressure, then Korea would not have done it in the way we did it, we would have to try to do it just to the extent that we could deal with the pressure coming from abroad. Then it could have ended up by leaving more, well, in a sense, negative side effects. But somehow it was the, well, meeting of external pressure as well as internal needs. So that is the reason why, in my mind, the liberalization had far more, say, positive impacts upon Korean economic development rather than negative impacts. So thank you for that answer. Uh, apart from that, you were also describing your thoughts about the um, the critics saying that Korea, South Korea, might have been premature for the uh, mm -hmm. accession for the mm -hmm. OECD mm -hmm. uh, in 1996, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you thought it was 
from my understanding, it was not premature, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and that you were ready for the for mm -hmm. the entrance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, if that was not the reason for the the, the primary reason for the uh, for the crisis happening mm -hmm. in '97, mm -hmm. what would then be the primary reason? Uh, would you say? Well, again, a very interesting question because uh, the financial crisis, Asian financial crisis, happened in 1997, mm -hmm. and uh, 1999. 1997, I was working for Korean mission to the OECD. 1999, I in fact was moved from France to Geneva. And I was working for Korean mission to the, to the WTO, from OECD to the WTO. And in the fall of 1999, then there is a UN body called ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council. And ECOSOC, uh, one year, they meet in New York. That's even number of years. And next year, they meet in Geneva. That's odd number of years. So in 1999, ECOSOC met in Geneva. And then there was something called interactive panel. And the theme for that interactive panel was the lessons of Asian uh, financial crisis. That, that was the title for the whole session, interac interactive session in, in the fall of 1999. And I told you about my interest in, in the Asian financial crisis. And then, of course, I just went there and was sitting in the hall, huge hall, right? Uh, that, that's something called the uh, UNOG, United Nations Office in Geneva. And then there was a, a, a hall called the uh, well, Hall of Nations. And that is the largest hall at the UNOG. And I was there, and then there were several panelists. And then one of the panelists said, well, in order to learn the lesson from Asian financial crisis, we should understand why financial crisis happened. And then he said, well, of course, there are a large number of causes. But in my mind, there was a single most important reason for the financial crisis in Asia, which was corruption, corruption of government officials. And then he said it. And I was just looking at him, <laughs> and I said to myself, I'm a government official coming from Korea. What is he talking about? <laughs> is he saying my corruption was responsible for the Korean financial crisis? And I said to myself, well, whatever I say, I must respond. So, well, there was my, uh, well, country, country uh, card. And then at, at the United Nations, then if you want to speak, then you just raise your flag, right? So I just raised my flag. And uh, well, after the panelists was, was done, were done, then I was the first to give an, give an opportunity to, to respond. So I said to myself, how much time do I have? Maybe 10 minutes, right? And then within those 10 minutes, I must come up with something, something smart to respond to him. If I say, well, panelists, I don't agree with you then it will be parallel, his words against my words, right? So it will be, at the best, it will be an even game, right? So I said to myself, well, I, in fact, must say something smart, right? Fortunately, something smart came up in my mind. That was, again, I'm talking about Paul Krugman too often today, but, but Paul Krugman, he, in fact, wrote a very interesting essay in The Economist magazine and then he was just pondering on the causes of uh, Asian financial crisis. And then what he said was the cause of Asian financial crisis, that is Pangloss syndrome. Anyone familiar with Pangloss? Anyone familiar with the Candide? You're familiar with Candide, right? That's a, that's a novel written by Voltaire, right? Candide, in that novel, Candide, uh, well, Pangloss is the name of his uh, tutor, I mean, tutor of uh, Candide. And then in that novel, Candide, the personalities in that novel, they represent certain human characteristics. Pangloss, the tutor of Candide, the human trait he represents is Groundless optimism. Optimism is good. 
but at the same time, what it represents, that's groundless optimism. And Paul Krugman, he said, well, in Asia, everybody wore panglosses. Bankers, they thought if you lend money, then he, he will be able to well, make a good profit out of it. Businessmen, when I borrow money and invest it, then, well, there will be no failure. I will make money. Government officials, they encouraged bankers, they encouraged businessmen to make big investment, bigger investment, without any concern about cash flow, right? So everybody was pangloss. They didn't think about the consequence. They didn't think about things going wrong. They kept on investing. That, in fact, was the cause of Asian financial crisis. And I read it, and I said to myself, that sounds very plausible. Because in Korea, at the time, we were saying, big horses never fail. <laughs> the bigger the horse is, then the better the, or the, the, the lower the chance of failure will be. So we were investing and investing and investing. We were not thinking too much about how to infect, uh, take care of, in case, in case there is some, something going wrong. We were not doing that. We were not taking sufficient precautions, right? So I just read Paul Krugman's article, and I said to myself, that in my mind, of course at the time, I was reading a large number of analytical materials on the causes of uh, financial crisis. And then to me, it sounded most plausible. If uh, I have to come up with a single explanation about, of, about the Asian financial crisis, I said to myself, that sounds most plausible. So what I said in that uh, echoes of meeting was this, which is that, well, there was one panelist who said the cause of Asian financial crisis, that is the corruption of uh, government officials. And I, in fact, am a government official coming from Asia. And because of it, I, of course, have given a lot of thoughts to this issue. And there are all different kinds of explanations, but if I have to come up with one single explanation, that will be what we learned from Paul Krugman. And then Paul Krugman said, maybe the most important explanation could be Pangloss effect. And I just looked around the whole hall, hall of nations, and I said, I hope you understand what Pangloss effect is, right? And then I explained about what Pangloss effect is. And then I wrapped up by saying, well, we learned an important lesson, so we will no longer be panglosses. And I stopped. People began to applaud. And people began to stand up. Whole, whole, well, audience, they just stood up. Something called standing ovation. And I felt extremely gratified. So that will be my answer. Panglos effect. And then I think we learned a lesson. And our banks became sounder. Our corporates became sounder. Well, I have to confess to you, at the time, back in 1997, the average debt ratio for a large number of Korean companies, you were surprised. It was 800%. 800%. Eight times more debt than your capital. That was the capital structure of a large number of Korean companies at the time. These days, well, there are very few of them who, in fact, would have debt ratio of more than 200%. $2 of debt to $1 of capital, right? So, the, in fact, there was a huge change in our banking sector, in our corporate sector, in our labor reform, in our public sector reform. So that's what we did in 1998, and that's the reason why I said we learned a big lesson and uh, we will no longer be panglosses. Thank you very much. Thank you.